Good morning. I'm John Alterman, Senior Vice President, Spigna Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy and Director of the Middle East Program at CSIS. And I'm delighted to welcome you here today to help roll out Will Todman's new report, Power and Recovery, Reform, Reconstruction, and Renewables in Conflict-Affected States in the Arab World. To explore the themes of that report, I'm joined by Will and three distinguished experts. Will's report looks at the potential of small renewable energy projects to both ease conditions in conflict-affected states and help contribute to better governance outcomes in the medium term. We're grateful to the Embassy of the State of Qatar, which supported the project. However, the views expressed in the report and today's discussion should be understood to be wholly those of the speakers themselves. Our conversation will start with a brief overview of the report, followed by a panel discussion and questions from you, the audience. To send your questions, please click on the Ask Live Questions button if you're watching on the CSS website, or click the link in the YouTube description. We begin our discussion with the author of Power and Recovery, Will Todman. Will is a fellow with the Middle East program whose research focuses on aid, sustainability, and displacement in the Middle East. He's conducted field research in nine countries in the MENA region, and he's widely published. Will is a 2022-23 Penn Kemble Fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy, a fellow at the Center for Syrian Studies at St. Andrews University, and a former Global Diversity Fellow at the Atlantic Council. He holds degrees from Georgetown and Oxford. Will, congratulations on publishing the report. What is it about and what did you find? Thanks so much, John. Well, before I started working at CSIS, I was working on besieged areas in Syria. And I came across some really remarkable stories. Mm -hmm. And there was one in particular that really stuck with me. It was about how people, how Syrians in these areas were using bikes mm -hmm. to generate electricity. Mm -hmm. So these areas had been cut off by the Syrian regime um, from state power. Uh, they also couldn't access fuel to operate generators. And so what they did is they hooked up bikes to batteries and they got young men uh, usually to pedal really, really fast and generate electricity. But you know, it's exhausting and really inefficient. It was only enough just about to, to um, generate enough electricity to have the lights on. So then they turned to solar mm -hmm. and they managed to smuggle some solar panels into the besieged area and they put them up on their roofs. But a lot of these were either destroyed during fighting or some were stolen. Mm -hmm. So they come up, came up with yet another adaptation, which was attaching solar panels to the wreckage of a burnt out car. And they developed some kind of um, mobile cart with solar panels on, which they could move around. And they hooked this up to uh, medical facilities, and it was enough to operate medical equipment. Mm -hmm. um, so this got me thinking that even in the most dire circumstances, mm -hmm. there are things you can do to improve the provision of electricity. Mm -hmm. And not having electricity is uh, really terrible in, in, in these uh, in environments. It exacerbates humanitarian crises, it stifles economic recovery, and it also drives f uh, tensions between different communities. Mm -hmm. And what I think is important to recognize is this isn't just in countries experiencing active fighting, but also in other conflicts, uh, in, in other countries where uh, fighting stopped maybe decades ago. Mm -hmm. uh, in Iraq and Lebanon, for example, um, the fighting stopped decades ago uh, in, in, in many areas, but the situation is getting worse, not better. So what I wanted to understand is how come billions of dollars of international assistance have failed to ensure reliable and affordable electricity in many of these places. Um, and so to do that, we focus in on four countries. We wanted to choose a range of countries that have different geographies, um, different experiences with conflict, uh, different sizes, different geographies. And we settled on Iraq, Lebanon, Libya, and Yemen. And my colleague, Lubna Youssef, uh, took on the, the Libya chapter. So we conducted field research from uh, rural Lebanon to uh, the old city of Mosul, which was destroyed in, in the fight against ISIS. 
and we did more than 170 interviews with um, international donors, um, aid actors, private sector actors, and, and experts as well. I think one of the key things that we found is that electricity crises are often deliberate. Mm. What I mean by that is that when electricity access is uneven, political actors can use it as a tool. You can use it to reward your allies, and you can use it to undermine your rivals. And sometimes we have seen different actors actually deliberately destroying electricity as, as a, a political tool. A series of ISIS uh, attacks in Iraq are some of the most prominent examples of this. Um, one of them destroyed a multi-hundred million dollar project, uh, a power station at Beji, which had only just opened um, a couple of months before. Mm. But it's also a huge money-making scheme. And this is, I think, another key finding of, of the research, that various actors have an interest in undermining electricity infrastructure mm -hmm. because they can make more money by forcing a reliance on informal methods and continuing to force a reliance on, on fuel imports. Mm -hmm. Fuel is often a source of a lot of corruption. But when you look at the informal uh, adaptations, I'm often talking about neighborhood level generators. And in places like Lebanon and Iraq, sometimes these uh, political actors have ties to generator owners. And they have an interest in um, ensuring that they have a monopoly in a given area and then taking a cut of their profit, which is often really significant. But as I said before, local communities are finding ways to work around these problems. And quite often, they're doing this by experimenting with renewables. And there are various ways in which renewables offer new opportunities in these really challenging environments. Partly, um, renewables are becoming cost competitive or even cheaper than traditional methods of uh, hydrocarbon-based uh, electricity generation. But there are specific reasons why uh, renewables are more resilient in fragile environments. Firstly, they are less reliant on fuel imports, and as I said before, these are a, a key um, area of uh, corruption as well. So they have, they have some benefits for, for uh, stemming corruption. But distributed uh, systems of renewable energy in which there are smaller scale bits of infrastructure that are more uh, local to where communities use the power, um, these can be built more quickly, uh, mm -hmm. even while conflicts remain. The impact of outages are more limited if they are destroyed in conflict. And because the ownership of these systems is also uh, decentralized, mm -hmm. that means it's much harder for monopolists to, um, to, 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 to gain a grip over these systems and, uh, and make a lot of money from them. So renewables can create really virtuous circles in, mm -hmm. in, in these environments, and, and uh, they you know, can stem humanitarian crises. They can accelerate uh, economic recovery, and they can also lead to better governance. Mm -hmm. So what do we take from this? I argue that in some situations, uh, donors should act earlier, they should think more politically, and they should learn from some of these local adaptations. This can't happen in, in all contexts, though. And I do highlight the importance of central authorities' capacity and vested interests in the status quo who work to uh, frustrate uh, the transition to, to renewable energy. Mm. And when there are really strong vested interests in places like Iraq and Libya, it can be really difficult to have promising change. Mm. But when there is reasonable capacity, uh, I think donors should really push to create an enabling environment mm. for renewables. Uh, and, and I think we're going to hear more um, from Christina Abi Haider about that later. Um, and, but even when there aren't strong governments, um, I argue that, that donors can still work at the local level they can experiment with different models of electricity provision, and then they can try to encourage other actors to replicate these models and scale them up. Mm. And I do want to stress that I know that donors are already doing this, including mm. some, some of the, the speakers around the table today. Um, but, and, but I believe that there is a window of opportunity in mm. some contexts, like Yemen, mm. to really um, push for these kinds of systems. And I think there would be several benefits. Mm. It would accelerate economic recovery. It would improve governance. And I think it would simultaneously set these countries on a pathway to greater environmental sustainability. Mm. Well, that's terrific. Thank you very much for that summary. I could not be more pleased 
with the three experts we have to discuss Will's report. Uh, Matthew Steinhelfer is Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of Conflict Stabilization, Op Conflict and Stabilization Operations. He leads the Bureau's efforts to anticipate, prevent, and respond to conflict and instability in the Western Hemisphere, Europe, and the Middle East and North Africa. Matt previously served in the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs, as well as with U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, and the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. Dr. Paul Nomba-Um is Director of Infrastructure mm -hmm. in the Middle East and North Africa at the World Bank. He has over three decades of experience in the infrastructure policy regulation and financial sector and has advised governments, utility companies, and private sector partners. Mm -hmm. For the last 25 years, he's worked at the World Bank, including roles as Country Director for states in Sub-Saharan and Southern Africa. Christina Abihaider is a practicing attorney in Lebanon a development and governance specialist, and a consultant to several companies and international organizations. She is joining us from Beirut. With more than a decade of experience in law, she specializes in the regulatory and environmental aspects of energy policies, contracts, and regulatory frameworks in the MENA region. She's drafted numerous laws, regulations, and decrees, including Lebanon's draft distributed renewable energy law. So welcome to you all. I am really looking forward to this conversation. Matt, let's start with you. Will argues that smaller scale renewable projects could support economic recovery, uh, better governance, and increase environmental sustainability in conflict affected states. How does that resonate with your priorities in the CSO Bureau? And what kinds of problems have you encountered pursuing that kind of approach? Well, first and foremost, let me just say thanks to CSIS for, for hosting this event. I think it's, um, especially with my fellow panelists, this is a sign of the direction that we need to go. Mm -hmm. We need to break down the silos between the scientific communities, the climate science community, environmentalists, mm -hmm. um, and the conflict or peace building uh, community and mainstream a lot of this work. Mm -hmm. um, so I think first and foremost, you know, the administration, the Biden-Harris administration has made it a priority mm -hmm. um, uh, not just climate, but integrating and mainstreaming a lot of our work. And this, the special presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry, has said it clearly. Um, while we must continue to do everything to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius mm -hmm. and avoid the most catastrophic consequences of climate change, the truth is the climate crisis is already here. And uh, we face unavoidable uh, climate hazards in the coming months. So what we're doing now um, through our national security strategy is um, trying to address the, uh, the impact of climate shocks on instability, conflict, and mass migration in a couple of key ways that we're doing that. Uh, first and foremost, it starts with the analysis and data. So in 2021, the Director of National Intelligence published the very first unclassified national intelligence estimate on climate change. And in it, for the first time, the U.S. government emphasized that the increasing physical effects of climate change are likely to exacerbate cross-border geopolitical flashpoints as states take steps to secure their interests. So the report um, specifically identified key countries where climate heightens the risk of instability, including in, this re in the Middle East and North Africa mm. region, Iraq. And we've seen this take place. So for example, when temperatures in parts of Iraq uh, reached 122 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius in 2021, mm. we saw protests arising over, mm. over heat-related power outages. We're also hearing reports from farmers in Iraq that described instances of climate-induced migrants' lack of jobs, leading them to join armed groups mm. in, in the area. So the key question is, what do we do in response? The, uh, the, there's already a number of great early warning systems that exist, um, especially related to famine and, and other environmental aspects. But what we're trying to do is push for better analysis and better systems that look for second or third order effects um, and also look at um, how can we increase our work upstream 
to have a market improvement on stemming conflict mm -hmm. and, and mitigating some of this work before it starts. So how are we doing that? The first is we're investing in data. Um, we're utilizing a multi-donor uh, funding uh, approach through the United Nations called the Complex Risk Analytics Fund, managed by the United Nations, um, to invest more in data sets that uh, look across climate and conflict-related issues. Second, we're also through the Global Fragility Act. Um, uh, we're implementing the US strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability. And in that work, we have a pr number of priority countries, including Libya, um, in which we're doing deeper analysis of the interconnectedness between conflict and climate. Our challenge is to truly tackle the root drivers of instability, including those exacerbated by climate. And this means doing what we're doing today breaking down the silos, work that we work in traditionally, um, bringing together data analysis, climate science, conflict prevention, humanitarian response, peace building communities, and energy communities to think about bridging those gaps and making sure that we're not just checking the box, but we're really enhancing resilience and adaptation initiatives mm. that are tackling root drivers. It also means that when resources shrink, in various communities. We have to recognize that traditional conflict resolution mechanisms may be insufficient um, to uh, address land or resource issues. So right now we're working across the US interagency to think through um, these, this intersection of climate and conflict, mm. including what are the innovative approaches that we can take on adaptation and resilience. And this is really important. This report is very important, um, especially as we talk about renewables, because where those are we're targeted, uh, mm -hmm. program efforts are targeted, we have the potential to mitigate also the root drivers of conflict and instability or bring communities together. So I'll close uh, with a quick anecdote. Um, in Yemen, we provided um, a number of different initiatives um, during uh, the conflict. And we advanced one specific community level uh, response that looked at advanced energy projects. So think solar panels, think other, um, uh, other issues there. And what we found was that um, it achieved meaningful results for that community. Stepping back uh, today and looking at that uh, small scale investment in that project, I think many of the things that John touched on were right. We have to think about scalability. How can we push further? How can we create a broader strategy, a data driven strategy, to not just think about the impact of conflict, but also address the root causes? And so I think we're still thinking through some of those specific types of approaches, but I'm hopeful through additional data and through some of our interagency um, strategic planning through the Global Fragility Act, we'll be able to advance some, some yeah. of these issues. Thank you, that's very helpful. I, I want to turn to Paul because mm. one of the things that Matt talked about mm. was what happens when you get into conflict. As the World Bank thinks about its investments, mm. how do you think about how conflict delays investment, obstructs mm. investment? How do you think about investing in places that are still experiencing conflict mm. and I'm especially interested in the applicability of, of Will's suggestion that perhaps some of these smaller scale mm. efforts would allow you to be involved earlier, which would mean that when Matt's team gets involved, mm. they would have a better foundation to build on. Yeah, very good, thank you. Thank you very much also, I'm pleased to be, there, to be here with you. It's a wonderful opportunity for us really to, to exchange on this important topic. Um, I mean, from my career at World Bank, I've went through different countries at different stages of fragility. And fragility is clearly a key component of development, right? So we have to assume when you engage in development that in some, in some, at some point in time, countries may be vulnerable and may fall into fragility. And when fragility is combined with what we call conflict and violence, then you have a cocktail which can take you to what you see now either in Syria or in Yemen and all these countries. And the end result of my 20 years plus doing this kind of work is that we should not retain a very linear approach. Yeah. You cannot do things only when you have peace and stability. Development has to take place all the way through. Even when conflict is happening, 
you need to invest in development. I mean, when we came up with a, with a nexus, humanitarian peace and development nexus, what does that mean? It means when a conflict starts, usually we, what do you see going first to these countries to assist people? It's the humanitarian organization. And what do they do? Giving bandages, meaning giving food, health support, medical assistance, all these things that they, they need to give to people so that people can survive. But it's important right at that stage to think about development. Because what we also know over the past 20 years that all these conflicts, when they start, we know when they start, we don't know when they will end. Mm -hmm. So you cannot sit back and say, okay, when peace will come, I will come back and do development. So that's the first principle that we really worked on. And in, at World Bank, we have put an emphasis in putting fragility, conflict, and violence as a concept, which is under, underpinning all our development kind of uh, intervention. I think when we do engage in a country, we do what we call a fragility assessment and a resilient assessment. And all these assessments are done to give us enough information to be able to tailor our intervention in order to help this country avoid a point whereby they will fall into a full conflict situation. And the decision making that we do will also prioritize the kind of intervention which are going to be more helpful and impactful to, to people. Now, coming back to, to the specific of electricity, and I think that's the reason why I think uh, I, was, I was really compelled by the report, because first of all, you touch on countries that I cover. I mean, Yemen is covered, uh, Lebanon is covered. I've spent many, 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 many hours visiting all, all these countries. Yemen, we cannot go there, but we do work through UN agencies. When it comes to a situation like uh, Yemen, for example, the, the World Bank cannot necessarily take the risk that some UN-based organizations are doing. And we cannot send our own staff when a conflict is taking place. But we have to intervene and provide support to the people of Yemen. And we do that through UN agencies on one side or through NGOs or civil society organizations. And I will give you an example of what we're doing in Yemen in, in a few minutes. In Iraq, and I'm just trying to touch on the issue of electricity and climate, most of these conflicts that we see shaping up across, when you look at them, all of them are climate related. I mean, when you look at really what's driving all these conflicts, most of them are driven by climate related kind of uh, uh, development. Iraq, you'll see, is an economy that's driven by hydrocarbons. And that has been the case for many years. And we all know with climate change that fossil fuel demand will go down at some point. And the basis of the revenue of the government of Iraq, which are 90% relying on hydrocarbons, may not be there in the future. So how do you get the economy of Iraq to diversify in order to continue to keep Iraq as a social fabric that is stable? That's really the question that Iraq is facing in the future. At World Bank, we did what we call a country climate diagnostic report on Iraq. And that report, which we published uh, in December, set the stage. Iraq will have to diversify the economy. But Iraq, more importantly, will have to engage forcefully in decarbonizing its oil sector and also in decarbonizing the electricity sector. Meaning what? It means Iraq has, I mean, plenty of resources when it comes to solar radiation. I think they can invest in renewable energy and they can really scale up generation of electricity through solar. They can do wind, so wind generation energy as well. At the same time, Iraq also has an issue of water scarcity, which is also affecting, and that's the point of adaptation that you raise. So all of that combined together, the question that Iraq and many other countries in the Middle East are facing is really how to reconcile the development kind of goals to the climate responsibility and obligation that they have subscribed to themselves. So, and this report that we did covering Iraq, we did another report on the same uh, lens for Morocco and for Egypt and also for Jordan. The conclusion is what? In the Middle East and North Africa region, the main challenge would be either water scarcity in terms of adaptation, because you have population growth, people will have food crisis kind of challenges. They will have land erosion affecting them and pushing them not to be able to continue cropping, depending on agriculture. But 
they also have opportunities, and most of these opportunities are on the mitigation agenda. And this is where your renewable energy agenda comes in. Now, last point from my end is how can we do what you have done and what you propose in your report? And when you look at what we have done in, in Yemen, it really goes squarely to your point. Mm. Yemen, a conflict is taking place. The access to electricity is very low. The grid is, has completely collapsed. But at the same time, we had to maintain supply of electricity to communities. What did we do? We put in 2018 a $50 million kind of grant, it's a concession uh, credit, to the government of Yemen, which is implemented through UNOPS, which is a UN agency, and that was made to help people access solar energy kind of equipment. It can be lanterns, it can be solar panels, and we have made electricity available to more than one million kind of people. We have also equipped community centers like health, education facilities with solar panels, which allows them to provide services that they're meant to do. We also did provide solar panel to allow people to access water resources. And this water resources is key to maintaining a certain level of livelihood, particularly when it comes to agriculture. So it means when you have a situation of conflict, you have to do things which are doable in that situation. In the context of Yemen, we couldn't invest, and we didn't invest in trying to fix the grid, because the grid would have been exposed to all the challenges that you described. So we decided to shift our intervention to focus at the community to strengthen the social cohesion of this community and contribute to peace building. And so, thank you very much. Let me bring Christine in. It seems to me that, that Paul described quite accurately the way climate is driving conflict in the Middle East. Lebanon, it seems to me the conflict isn't really driven by climate. It's driven by the politics of Lebanon. Lebanon's civil war supposedly ended a third of a century ago, and yet we still think of Lebanon as a conflict-affected state. How does Lebanon's history of conflict continue to affect things like the energy sector? First, uh, allow me to thank you and thank uh, CSIS for giving me the opportunity to be among you and discuss this important topic and the paper that's been drafted because it's really like very valuable. Um, as you mentioned that the war ended more than 30 years ago in Lebanon, but it had direct implication on infrastructure. It destroyed the infrastructure in Lebanon, but like it didn't only have this direct implication on infrastructure, it also destroyed and corrupted the politicians' mentality and way of thinking. And this is the hardest thing to fix. Uh, like um, from my point of view, like politicians tend to have um, a chaotic enabling environment. Whenever the enabling environment is chaotic, this is a good uh, uh, area for politicians because it serves in their interest. Um, like imagine Lebanon, um, the war ended more than 30 years ago. Uh, during the war, we had um, like sometimes electricity. Now we are witnessing like almost total blackouts. We've been running our uh, um, power plants on heavy fuel oil um, and diesel generators like are uh, uh, the, the main rescue for all Lebanese, the private uh, diesel generators. Um, our tariff has been like uh, a fix since 1994. No change in tariff since 1994 until last November because we are totally collapsed economically and financially. Um, it has been subsidized, uh, no tariff change and mainly, mainly no rule of law. Like imagine we have a law that dates back to uh, 2002, which regulates the electricity sector and all international community and all uh, like uh, even the Lebanese and like uh, international organizations do know about this law, which regulates the electricity sector. Uh, this law has been ratified in 2002, but never been implemented. So, this law calls for uh, appointment of an independent regulatory authority. And since 2002, we didn't have any regulatory authority in place to regulate the electricity sector. Or like we want, the politicians want to modify the law before appointing an independent regulatory authority. So this is like, it's like insane. So 
it's not by chance. It's not by chance we don't have electricity. It's on purpose. Our politicians are corrupted enough that this chaotic enabling environment serves at their interest. They do have direct interest in fuel imports in uh, private generators in like subsidizing electricity because it serves in their political clientelism. So like, despite all this, uh, like uh, black picture, we do have window of hopes through the efforts of donors and international organizations. Um, mainly like when it comes to small RE interventions. Like imagine Lebanon is a rich country in all RE resources, in uh, water, sun, and wind. And till day, to our date, we do not have a national RE project. So like this is by chance or intentionally. I'm a Lebanese and I've been working in several areas in the MENA region. And I like, I'm confident that this is on purpose and intentionally. So despite all this uh, black picture, we do have, as I mentioned, some uh, light of hopes, like the support of donors in drafting the DRE financing to draft the distributed renewable energy draft law. And hopefully now I get the chance to talk about this and how also politicians are like tending not to pass this law or to modify it before passing it, the same as for law 462. This is one. Two, also the efforts of international organizations in some uh, renewable energy projects at local authorities or uh, through the support to the public utility, which is EDL. But mainly like uh, now we're in a state of total collapse and it's like a prerequisite for us to enroll uh, through an IMF program and to get like the assistance from the World Bank in order to get the uh, uh, Jordanian electricity and the gas from Egypt. And this is conditioned if uh, uh, under certain prerequisites like the change in the tariff, which took place like last November without any, any, any alert, it has uh, 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 changed from 1,500 exchange rate, and now we're paying for our uh, uh, public utility electricity uh, around 100,800 per uh, kilowatt. So also like this is for Lebanese too much to handle where, where when their money is confiscated. Uh, to also like to have uh, 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 like uh, eliminate and as much as possible to um, put end to technical and non-technical losses. And this is very important. Non-technical losses are severe all over the uh, Lebanese territory. Like lots of people pay their tariff, they pay, the, pay their bills, but majority do not pay their bills. Public institutions do not pay their bills to the public utility. Uh, we have lots of uh, refugee camps that do not, uh, cannot afford paying their, uh, tariff, their bills for the public utility. So uh, also uh, they, they are calling um, uh, to have main reforms by implementing law 462 and appointing an independent regulatory authority. And here I emphasize by saying independent regulatory authority, we don't want as Lebanese to have any regulatory authority in place. We want to have it autonomous and independent, not politically affiliated, in order to relieve the sector from this political like dominance and interference. Thank you very much, Christina. There's, there are a lot of, obviously a lot of issues there, but, but let me try to zoom in. Paul, you recently visited yeah. a local solar project mm. in the Bekaa Valley in mm. Eastern Lebanon, mm. a project that Will mentions in his report. What were you trying to learn about that initiative what did you find and how does it relate to some of the issues that Christina just raised? I think Christina has um, covered the ground. I mean, I don't need to repeat what she said. I mean, we have been trying to address the issue of Lebanon electricity sector for the past 20, 20 years plus. And uh, we haven't been able to be successful, not because we haven't tried or we don't know the recipe. Everybody knows the technical solution. The problem is political and we need a political solution. I don't want to detail further, but she has given you uh, the bulk of it now. And when I went to, to Lebanon last February, uh, it was my trip, my first trip after two years due to COVID. Uh, so when I landed there, first thing that I realized is that the grid has collapsed. During, during my previous trip, there was electricity almost like 18 hours a day. 
So I didn't see any major issue back then. But during this trip, I realized that the crisis was really sinking in. There was no light. Even the street lights were down. And the day I landed in Beirut was the day service, EDL grid service resumed to go to five hours a day. So at least there was an attempt to reestablish uh, public service supply of electricity. Uh, and we realized everything that she mentioned, the condition that she, she, she referred to are conditions we have discussed. Because we really believe that to fix the problem, we need to see concrete action. And these conditions about what she mentioned are really concrete steps. We don't want paper reforms. We want concrete steps showing that this time around the problem will be solved. And in so doing, we also acknowledge that it may take time to achieve this condition. And in the meantime, we have to take the opportunity of technology. And this is where the distributed uh, renewable energies approach comes into life. And then my team had recommended to me to go to the Baker Valley. There was an initiative there led by a private kind of uh, entrepreneur providing electricity to his community. And so I traveled, I, we drove there for five hours, and we visited, and we saw the system. It's like, it's a 700 kilowatt kind of system, supplying electricity to 400 kind of families, uh, quite a large kind of community, but quite well managed. And people are receiving between 14 to 16 hours of electricity a day. They're having, it's a hybrid system, which is combining generators, for time, because there are days where the sun is not just able to, to deliver much, and they have battery storage as well. And all of that provides some sense of reliable electricity, while the rest of the country is not getting the reliable supply. So we need to start thinking of how we can transition the system from the old fossil fuel based system, which we need. We need a base load grid. But while that is being fixed, I think we need to, to make sure that the Lebanese, the people of Lebanon, can still have access to electricity. And as a matter of fact, since the crisis of electricity sector started in Lebanon two or three years ago, what has happened in the meantime is that most households who can afford it has equipped themselves with solar system. I mean, we have estimated a total amount of 400 megawatt in rooftop solar system deployed in one year in, in Lebanon just for people to continue having access to electricity. And I think we have to create an enabling environment for it because we also don't want to completely undermine the whole grid because everyone is investing in his or her system. The sum of these investments are, at the end of the day, suboptimal because it's not done in a very efficient manner. So we need to create an enabling environment that allows us to make sure that this investment can be done in a more optimized way, and that's why the project I visited became to have a good sense, because it's a community project where the solar farm is located in one place, but supplying electricity to different households around it. It's not like every household with its own solar panel. Let me leave it there. Matt, Paul's an economist who's talking about optimizing. You have been involved in conflict-affected areas for years. You've seen a whole range of them. How does what Christina and Paul are describing, how much of that in a Lebanese case is actually generalizable? And what have you learned in your work that suggests that, that, that the kinds of ideas Will's putting forward might help us thread the needle on some of these problems? I, I think it's very relatable. Um, and, and in fact, I think a lot of the, the terms that we're using, optimizing our results, um, addressing social cohesion, addressing governance and rule of law, I think, I think where we're at right now in the peace building community is that in some sense, we need to get back to the basics mm -hmm. of, um, you know, democracies need to deliver for their people. Good governance comes from um, individuals seeing results and feeling heard. And I think what we're trying to do through a lot of our integrated strategies is not just to look at um, putting a Band-Aid on some of these challenges, but really looking for those scalable investments that um, can address across sectors many of the core grievances um, from over time. Many of those have been um, resource-related issues. 
I think where our challenge um, ahead of us is going to be, get even more complex is that with the um, challenges of the climate crisis in particular, we're going to need even more nuanced, more complex solutions than we've ever had before. And this is why right now it's so important for us to break down our silos across our communities and talk to one another and see where are there opportunities to optimize our work together. I firmly believe that bringing, uh, at the end of the day, um, for conflict uh, prevention to work, we have to bring communities together. And bringing communities together, you can do that around a number of topics. And we've done these types of programs around the world before. Whether that's using environmental concerns to bring communities together, whether that's to bring communities uh, together around uh, peace discussions or participatory budgeting. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity if we sit down together and design integrated strategies that we can actually scale up and optimize results rather than having a smattering of disparate projects that don't actually achieve strategic impact. Christina, you've worked in places that haven't really had enabling legal environments. I'm thinking the logical way would be if you would create an enabling legal environment and then you could move forward on all the integrated things that Matt is talking about. What is your experience on the process of both of simultaneously trying to build an enabling legal environment, but also moving forward in the absence of an enabling legal environment? What kinds of lessons has, does your experience lend to people like Matt who are trying to do this in messy places all over the world? Yeah, like um, I totally agree with Paul and Matt, like, okay, I'm not, I'm against these like small individual solutions because like these tend to be chaotic and this is will be like um, just offering solutions for people that can afford this a commodity electricity is not a like a luxury commodity it is a need and it is a basic need as a per the human rights like it is a, 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 like our right to have electricity because it have direct implications on all our uh, lives and on the internet on water education health like it has direct uh, effect on all the economy and we cannot talk about any economic reform or like a, a, a recovery before we have electricity and recover the electricity sector. Um, I'm like against some uh, individual solutions. I'm with like collective solutions. And this was my main goal through drafting the distributed renewable energy draft law uh, in order to pave the way to open the sector for private to private without any intermediaries or boundaries uh, in order not to have bottlenecks like going back to the public utility or to the Ministry of Energy and Water and have politics back in the plate. So um, unfortunately, politics played its role again, and they, uh, the minister had to uh, insert some changes, making the law not uh, uh, applicable, even if it is ratified. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about some solutions, uh, through all my uh, work experience, I tend to work in a legal way in order to ensure the sustainability of donors' money and investments. Uh, the goal is not like to have something operational right now and once the program uh, ends, it is not operational or not sustainable of, or if any change in the uh, uh, economic circumstances or situation or in the uh, legislation, this may hinder the sustainability of these interventions. For this reason, through my experience and through my expertise, I tend to work a lot with local authorities. And the, the, the example mentioned by Paul in, in Bika is a good example, but be careful like Paul, like this example is tending to use public utility assets and this is illegal. Yeah. I try to avoid through my consultancies in order to avoid any legal implications, any legal like uh, uh, fire back uh, cases from the government or the public utility. I'm with collective uh, solutions. So for this reason, either we try to work with communities, local authorities, try to be creative and think out of the box through the creation of energy committees uh, or oversight committees, having um, uh, an illegal context, giving them like a legal uh, legality, legal model in order to ensure that uh, once the donor or uh, the organization steps back, 
that this community is able to sustain and operate fully the 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 uh, the interventions that has, it has been granted also like having a uh, cost share is an ultimate um, also way of thinking in order to have the buy in of the community for this reason we need to always distinguish between like direct relief as we mentioned like in your uh, opening uh, uh, remarks and like direct relief where donors tend to give like fuel uh, diesel generators and between development projects so when it comes to development projects there should be a kind of careful studying for the enabling environment trying to work as much as possible in a sustainable manner uh, also we shouldn't avoid working with the public utility like uh, uh, public utilities usually do have uh, autonomy and uh, uh, it's uh, like advisable to work with institutions rather than a minister which is political uh, has a political like um, a hat uh, and, like institutions do have sustainability too like working with edl in lebanon this also could be healthy and i had like several uh, uh, good uh, uh, cases to be replicated thank you very much um paul she's a lawyer you're an economist then so. What is the role of lawyers hmm. and the kinds of things Christine was talking about in the plans that the World Bank and economists are trying to introduce in fragile states? Do you, do you, where, where does the law hmm. foundation hmm. enter into your programming decisions? I mean, from, from, from the start. Because we can't do anything if there's no legitimacy to what we're doing, right? So the first thing we do, we need to make sure that what we're doing has a legitimacy. And that's the reason why we pay attention to engaging with legitimate government. And when we have a, a situation whereby we don't have a legitimate government, and therefore we are obliged to work with third party, UN organization or uh, NGOs. But coming back to the specific what, what Christine was talking about, uh, I mean, when you do this kind of sector engagement, first thing you do is get a government to, I mean, to, 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 to outline what's the visionary approach. I mean, what do they visualize about that sector, given the realities of Lebanon? And you get them to, to project a little bit that vision. And the government of Lebanon have done it several times. And then, from that vision, you, 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 you outline what I will call the legal framework, which will support the implementation of the vision. And this is what she's talking about when she's talking about the di uh, distributed renewable energy draft legislation. The vision is that Lebanon has to transition to clean energy. Lebanon has a lot of sun radiation, has a lot of wind, have some land, and they can tap into the resources which is going to make Lebanon less dependent from fuel import. So energy security problem would be addressed. That's more or less the vision, right? And how do you get that done? You need the underpinning legislation. That's the legal framework, that's the law. Of course, that law will have to be supported by all the stakeholders. And this is where politics come in. Mm -hmm. And this is where the factionalism of Lebanon comes in. And therefore, the law becomes like a, I mean, a, 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 uh, I mean, a fighting kind of uh, 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 um, uh, scenario where every party is trying to grab uh, a portion of it. But at the end of the day, the intent is good. The intent is good because what the, the system didn't do until now, the market has done it. Because people are buying this solar system. People are installing them. That part of the market is booming. But if we don't put some order, it's going to be chaotic, and therefore it's going to be counterproductive. So what Christine is telling me, at least as an economist, is that I need to pay attention to the legality. For example, in the example of Baker Valley, yeah, that private pro uh, operator is using the electric poles of EDL, and EDL hasn't agreed for that. So, this is the, the Lebanese electrical company. Yeah, yes. So, of course, if she was involved in that conversation with EDL and that private operator, maybe she would have helped them to come to what I would call a facility sharing agreement. Like, I mean, they can sign an agreement whereby, I mean, that uh, Baker 
electricity, whatever community provider, who will sign a facility sharing agreement to use EDL electric poles. And they will be paying EDL for the utilization of these poles because they're laying their cable over the, uh, the poles, electric poles of EDL. And they don't have the right to do so, according to Lebanese law. So, Matt, this is a complicated political mess. How successful can the U.S. government be trying to untangle exactly the kinds of problems that Christina and Paul are talking about? I think that's a great question. Um, I think part I thought you were going to have an answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think what we're what we're trying to do now um, is to approach many of these very complex challenges with humility, and I think that is a fundamental shift in the U.S. government approach yeah. um, over time. And um, much of our approach right now, especially in the monitoring, evaluation, and learning um, space, is to do things like this, bring in lots of different ideas and open up um, ourselves to um, hearing different uh, approaches, different ideas, and stress testing our work along the way. Um, so through some of our work that we're, we're uh, doing underneath the Global Fragility Act, the U.S. strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability, um, from the beginning of our process, we have opened up our doors mm -hmm. um, to more collaborative approach, not just with the traditional stakeholders, like um, various groups that we would normally uh, work with in impl implementation or national government entities, but doing stakeholder consultations with a wide variety of groups, including at the local level. Um, in one country for this initiative, um, we reached out to over 300 different individuals mm -hmm. across a wide spectrum of, uh, of society. And so I think taking that approach and taking a learning agenda approach mm -hmm. will enable us to see, hmm, maybe in this type of project we yeah. need to provide more conflict resolution or listening facilitation skills. Mm -hmm. and maybe that is the thing that will unlock or accelerate some mm -hmm. of our success. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm optimistic uh, that we are um, learning from across these various environments, but I think we, we, we have to approach it with humility. Mm -hmm. Paul, we have an online question and somebody said look you have this really messy mm. environment but one of the things the messy environment does is it keeps international investors from playing a larger role mm. are international investors part of the solution you're envisioning and if they are mm -hmm. what would make it attractive mm. for them if what we're seeing Christine and, and, and Matt are describing is essentially a, a political free-for-all yeah, of course, I mean, everyone, everyone has a role to play. I mean, starting from the community and all the way to international investors, I really agree. Uh, even when we speak now, I mean, you have investors going to, to Beirut and investing in Beirut, even though the economy is collapsing, right? I mean, people are still looking and finding opportunities. But at the end of the day, they're asking for one thing, predictability, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uncertainty of regulatory framework. Because when you get your equity into a country, you want to make sure that the rules are not going to be changed overnight. That's the first thing. Second thing, you want to know if tomorrow you want to do something, what are the rules that are going to prevail over that thing? And this is what the World Bank does. When we engage with countries, with government, we help them create that enabling environment that provides that predictability and certainty of effective implementation of rules. And we really push hard to make sure that that situation improves. And we have been quite successful in some cases, but not always successful. But what I can tell you is that over time, I always see investors coming back to us, asking us to do more so that they can go to the same countries where we believe uh, fragility is probably not uh, so compelling. But they see opportunities there for, for, for themselves. For returns. Let me ask Christina, you've been very involved in this draft renewable energy law. As Paul said, there's a whole series of things in the environment. What do you think the most important other things are besides the draft renewable energy law that you've been involved with for several years? Um, like uh I've been, I've been part of uh, the national committee who drafted the first renewable energy for Lebanon since 2009, and this law never saw the light. It, it was kept in the parliament's drawers. And 
as I said earlier, this is not by chance, this is intentionally, because as long as the enabling environment is chaotic, this is an enabling environment for politicians to have this dominance over the electricity sector. For this reason, like I urge the international organizations, like please support the people in the conflict affected environments. Because even like sometimes we tend to have elections and, and we elect uh, our, our representatives, but sometimes we don't bring them like, uh, you know, we don't have the say. They are um, imposed on us, even if it is under a democratic uh, 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 like uh, scheme. For this reason, like lots of Lebanese are desperate. I'm talking about Lebanon because like I'm living now here and I'm also like a Lebanese desperate. Uh, we urge like the DRE is important to be drafted, to be ratified the soonest because it will open the way. It is like a private to private uh, mechanism, which will allow uh, uh, also uh, the appetite for the investments in Lebanon, which will call for private sector to come and invest in Lebanon until now. In many countries, like we have monopoly for the public utilities, also like Lebanon, uh, EDL exercises a monopoly. You're not allowed to generate, transmit, or distribute electricity. And this is like uh, insane. Law 462, dated 202, which regulates the electricity sector, calls for the private sector involvement, but has never been implemented on purpose, although it has been ratified. The DRE law, although we uh, established a national committee inviting the Ministry of Energy to be part of it, at the end, the minister did insert major changes hindering the law not to be applicable, except if they have a say as politicians in this law. So like we are pushing a lot as Lebanese through the support of international organizations and through the donor community, but we still need to push more. Um, our politicians are always resistant, as I mentioned, like uh, they don't care if people are dying without electricity. Uh, they are living in their own castles. They have this commodity, while others uh, who have the privilege is able to get some uh, um, individual solar panels and who cannot afford this is, believe me, is dying without electricity or paying a very high uh, 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 bill for this uh, 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 like uh, service, uh, basic service. So like... Um, I'm, I'm like pushing a lot through my um, consultancy, through my role as a legal expert, through different organizations. I've been part of numerous international organizations working with them, and I'm still like keen to push for reforms, and this is much needed. Thank you. Uh, well, look what you've done. <laughs> you've, you've provoked, a, I think, a really thoughtful but, but very um, uh, Engage an interlocked conversation amongst people from very different, di very different stakeholder groups. Just before we close, I'm wondering if you heard anything especially surprising, or what you think the really important elements are to come out of this conversation that you, that you helped provoke. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think this this uh, the idea of sustainability is so key here. I mean, environmental sustainability, of course, but also thinking about the sustainability of these projects over the longer term. Mm. I do think that, um, as you said, Paul, we can't have a linear approach mm. to, to conflict. And so we need to act earlier, mm. but we need to be thinking, even as we do that, how can this set a society on, on a more sustainable pathway? Mm. How can we make sure that this is legal? Mm. We can we make sure that this isn't going to be undermined by other actors? Mm. And I hope that some of the ideas in the report um, spark some more conversations about these kinds of the, the kinds of ways to do that. Thank you very much. I want to thank Will Todman for for keying up this whole discussion. I want to thank Matt Steinhelfer and Dr. Paul Nomun and Christina Abichader for joining us today. Uh, if you are interested in the report and learning more, I hope you are. You can read Power and Recovery on www.csis.org. If you don't want to read the whole thing. We have a one-page fact sheet. We have an executive summary. We have a podcast. We have a video. There are all kinds of resources to, to give you a sense of the richness of this report. And I hope you'll take a look. Uh, in the coming weeks, we will be releasing an Arabic version and several shorter pieces. So thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.